The Aggressor Squadron's at Nellis transitioned from the T-38 to the F-5E Tiger II in 1975. The Clark-based squadron followed in 1977. We went from T-38s to when I came back from the Philippines, we went, we got F-5s. And, um, I don't know if you remember the when Vietnam fell, uh, there was a, a suddenly a surplus of F fives running around, and they were owned by the State Department of all things because that was a part of a, a military assistance program that was headed to boister the uh, Saigon government. And of course, then they fell, and now they got already bought and paid for off the assembly line plus a lot of F fives that were flown out of Vietnam into Thailand, you know, when the guy, when it fell, a lot of the pilots escaped in the F, in the F-5, and yeah. even two in a cockpit, which is just incredible. There was a hundred and some odd airplanes. The single-seat Northrop F-5E Tiger II was an improved version of the F-5A Freedom Fighter, on which the T-38 was based, and was the best simulator for the MiG-21, but also came without some of the T-38's gripes. Henderson had long maintained that the T-38 was ill-suited to the aggressor role. In certain negative and zero-g flight conditions, its main undercarriage doors would delaminate and then be sucked open. The result was that the main gear doors would be pulled into the slipstream and ripped away. The gear doors would then impact the aft fuselage belly, slicing through control cables and causing total loss of control of the aircraft. Henderson recalled that as many as four such incidents had occurred, claiming the lives of at least six pilots before one lucky soul managed to recover a stricken T-38 back to base at Clark and lived to tell the tale. He had battled over the T-38 issue with his close friend, Major David D.L. Smith, who was at TAC headquarters planning a fifth aggressor squadron to be made up of T-38s. Between 1976 and 1977, Smith was working long and hard at the TAC staff to form this fifth aggressor squadron, its mission would be to do all of the initial training of the new aggressor pilots and take the load off of the 64th and 65th. Smith intended to use T-38s to equip the new squadron, but Henderson pleaded his case with him, both from Clark and then from Nellis when he arrived back in 1977, and asked that he kill the T-38 training squadron concept. Initially, Smith was highly resistant, especially since he had done such an extraordinary job of selling it to the air staff. But Smith initiated his own research into the issue, poring over T-38 safety records at Norton Air Force Base. He found a common thread. Other units were experiencing the same geared or problem. All of the units that had suffered losses had a high-speed, unloaded flight profile in their mission. They were the Edwards Air Force Base, Test Chase Aircraft, the US Air Force Thunderbirds, and the Aggressors. Henderson recalled that he did the right thing, and the 5th Squadron never happened. After 15 months of developing Cope Thunder, Henderson returned once again to Nellis as the ops officer of the 64th Aggressor Squadron. He immediately noted a change, the so-called Nevada Freestyle, sneaky aggressor tactics that got training wins but probably wouldn't have worked in a real combat situation. Tricky, tricky tactics to, to win the fight, to win the merge. And, and so now we're progressing into technology uh, issues uh, suddenly the F-15s in the world, and we're not, <laughs> picture an F-5, little bitty airplane against a hard wing F-4. The F-5 is going to win, 90% um, of those, unless you get a very well flown F-4 and maybe a slat wing F-4 and a weapon school pilot, you know. Otherwise, the F-5, you can't see him, he gets to the merge, uh, big uglies out there, coal burning engines, you know, smoking, Two eyeballed but big airplane, and so the little guy sees big airplane, gets in position, and wins 90% of the time. Now you go forward in time to an F-15, even bigger airplane, but technology now. He's got a radar that can find you everywhere, and he can maneuver like a son of a bitch. And he can win that close-in fight most of the time if he's a good pilot. And then you go to the F-16, little bitty airplane, very maneuverable high-tech uh, radar weapons, everything. So now this little F-5 is getting outdated. You know, it's, it's losing the technology fight. And so surviving to the merge becomes a problem for the F-5 world, the aggressor world. Uh, there was a program called ACEVAL, AIMVAL, very large, uh, enormous, multi-year test that was here. 
trying to figure out what is the best tactic for the future and what weapon are we going to buy. Uh, there are concept weapons, a, a claw and the agile missile and all these, these concept weapons that were being looked at. Navy involved, uh, they had F-14s, they, they had helmet mounted sights, they had things that we don't even have today in terms of technology. And there, it was a, it's a shame, it's a lot of money and everything, but it, it ended up being a, a, a knife fight in a phone booth because they had to be constrained by the ACMI. Um, and so, um, out of all of that, um, started developing Nevada Freestyle, I guess is, is the best description of it. Do whiffer deals and turns and burns and hide under each other and turns, you know, things that in real combat, it reminds me of the Indiana Jones movie where he's facing the guy with the samurai, you know, and, he's, and he just pulls out his pistol and shoots him and walks away. <laughs> Simplicity is, is, the, is the key to air combat success. He also noted the inclusion of the aggressors in the weapon school's training rides. The intensity of missions went up, uh, mainly in the weapon school. Uh, it's it's gone under a very various names over over time, but it's the graduation portion of the fighter weapons schools, and it's to this day it's the culmination of their their six months of training. They have a mock war where the rules are very loose. Uh, meaning it's very uh, intense. You got to be very sharp, or you'll get killed, literally. Um, and they they play where when you're shot down, you're out of there. You leave, you go home. No regeneration. Um, a severe penalty. I mean, you you flunk the ride. You know, I mean, it's just in, incredible rules. Uh, and during a certain portion of of my career like when I came back from the Philippines, uh, it was its most intense, where the, the rules were the least stringent and allowed the most aggressive flying at low altitude especially of anything I've, I've seen uh, before or since. And so uh, it was like combat for our guys, our young uh, F-5 pilots then, and it, a big worry for an ops officer like me, you know, because I'd go, we're doing what? Uh, and it has to do with maneuvering at low altitude, uh, air combat maneuvering at very low altitudes. And uh, essentially, uh, they had some quasi rules about less than 90 degrees of bank and, and some other things. But when you actually applied it and got out there, um, it was a low altitude flying contest a lot of times. I mean, down, you know, kicking up dust and, and very scary for anybody, especially people who hadn't flown at low altitude. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we had a whole low altitude training program, you know, trying to keep people, you know, hitting the ground. Um, now you combine that with a young group of guys who are very capable pilots, but it's a very intense uh, model, role model from the weapon school, where it's you want to kill every F4 out there, and and the more you kill, the better you are, and and so your ego gets gets up here, and then you got to switch gears and now go out and deploy to Holloman against a you know, <laughs> much less intense environment. And it's hard for them, it's very difficult for those kids to adjust to that. And they tended to, to let their ego get away and a lot of uh, cocky discipline kind of problems uh, popped up and down through through that era. Luckily, <laughs> I was only uh, an ops officer for, for about a year of that kind of environment and then I was in the Red Eagles. While herding cats became Henderson's job, for Scott, a certain monotony crept in that required some introspection to shake loose. It was perhaps inevitable that an aggressive pilot would reach this point once they were at the top of their game. The, the only ex really exciting things were when we'd be the adversaries in the Cope Thunder program where we could go out in a multi-ship and get into uh, engagement with more airplanes, etc., etc. I had actually, about the early part of 79, I just about had enough of being an aggressor. I wanted to go do something different. I said, it's selfish, but it was an excitement thing. And the same briefings and the same debriefings on and on, it was the same thing all the time. I needed to do something different. So uh, I, I started thinking about that. So that's why I explored, hopefully I'd get an F-16 as opposed to being sent to an F-4 squadron back in the States. 
And then one day I, I, I said, you know, I slapped myself in the face and said, what are you, what are you thinking about here? You got the best job in the world, fighter pilot world. All you do is air to air. You don't have to practice for ORIs. You don't have to put on gas masks. You don't even have to fly at night. Uh, although a couple of us did main, but it, uh, maintain uh, night qualifications so we could be interceptor uh, targets for the F-4 squadrons at, at Clark. But there was only a couple of us that were night qualified. I said, you got the, the fighter world by the tail here. And so, and then after that, I never looked back. I, I never ever regretted or or it never got boring to me after that anymore. I it just it was just one of those things. I guess it probably happens to everybody in their life, whatever their profession is, they think about it, say, hey, is this what I really want to do? Have idea. While the aggressors had been establishing themselves and Suter had been devising Red Flag, a very small cadre of fighter weapon school and aggressor pilots had been pulled aside for special duties in a world that few knew existed. In absolute secrecy, America had continued to operate the MiGs of Drill, Ferry and Donut. In fact, the collection of the enigmatically named assets or articles was growing. The exploitation at MiGs at Groom Lake was very much still alive. The program, under the control of Air Force Systems Command, had continued to grow to as many as four flights in a single day, according to aviation historian Peter Merlin. A MiG-17PF Fresco D had arrived, as had several more MiG-21 airframes, from which a single MiG-21 was made flyable using parts from all of them. The rest were kept as a source of spare parts. The Air Force now had a total of two MiG-21 F-13 Fishbed CEs and two MiG-17 Fresco CDs. The Air Force Systems Command Group called themselves the Red Hats, and in 1973 came up with a unit emblem. It featured a bear wearing a white brim red hat surmounting a global hemisphere, all against a yellow background. Six stars arced over the top. Two tabs included the name, Red Hats, and the motto, More with Less. The motto symbolised the team's ability to consistently produce useful data despite the challenges of operating from a remote location with a small cadre and having to scrounge or make spare parts to keep the aircraft flyable. From the weapons school, Majors Randy O'Neill and Gail Peck, both weapons school instructors, were given access to the MiG-17s in late 1972 and allowed to fly the aircraft in 1v4 engagements against fellow 414th Fighter Weapons School instructors and crews from the 555th or Triple Nickel Tactical Fighter Squadron, the latter of whom were due to deploy to Vietnam. These engagements, which reportedly had no altitude restrictions, were intended to test improvements made to the F4E known as the 556 mod and were conducted under the codename Rivet Haste. The encounters taught the F4 crews to use the vertical plane of motion against the nimble MiG and were judged overall to be a great success. Meanwhile, at least eight aggressor pilots were also given access to the MiG-17 and MiG-21 from 1972 onwards. The first were Kobe Mayo, Gene Jackson, D.L. Smith and Mike Press. This research was so classified that not even their fellow aggressors knew what they were doing. The sorties were flown under the umbrella program Have Glib, and logistical and intelligence support was furnished by the CIA. Wendell Shawler, the Chief of Fighter Flight Tests for Air Force Systems Command, was the project officer for GLIB. He told me that between 1970 and July 1971, he checked out as many as 40 pilots from both Air Force Systems Command and TAC in the MiG-17 and MiG-21. He was later replaced by Major Norm Suits. Among the first of the TAC pilots checked out by Suits was Mike Press. From Vietnam, Press had been assigned to be the air-to-air -air instructor pilot to the comparatively sedate world of the F-4 school at MacDill, and it was while he was here in his second year that he was handpicked by O'Neill and Wells to join the initial cadre of aggressors in 1972. With the aggressors still brand new, he had been tasked to write up the academics on the MiG-17 and the MiG-21. I was one of the charter members of the, of the aggressor squadron, and I was fortunate enough to be picked to fly the MiG-21 also. I was just a young captain at the time, you know, coming out of F-4s. Uh, and then Randy O'Neill called me in his office and said, hey, uh, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you to a place. I can't tell you where, when, but or what it's all about, but uh, you can't tell anybody about this. And so he's the one that got me into the MIGs. I felt very privileged and honored, you know. 
So we got checked out in those through the Soviet formations in the MiG-21 and then uh, flew them against uh, F-4s and Navy F-14s and uh, the current current airplanes. And then uh, we would come back and brief the squadron, make sure that the T-38 formations and, and performance matched the MiG-21. Flying the MiGs, therefore, gave him the practical familiarity he'd need to validate his teachings. On May 30, 1973, Air Force Systems Command consolidated the Air Force's MiG exploitations and initiated the blanket program Have Idea as the follow-on to Have Glib. Idea itself would be replaced by Have Phoenix in the mid-1980s. The newly devised idea would leave Air Force Systems Command maintaining overall operational control of the airborne test assets and management of test activities, but made it easier for the Air Force, Navy and Marines to share the assets. O'Neill is often the individual credited with not only getting TAC pilots access to IDEA, but in getting IDEA started to begin with. He was still well connected within Air Force Systems Command, and he'd been flying the MiGs since Donut and Drill. Administration of IDEA's TAC component was done through Glenn Frick's Detachment 1 of the 57th Fighter Weapons Wing, and it was this influence that allowed him and Peck to use the MiGs, temporarily borrowed from Glib, during Ribbit Haste. Flying the assets was agreed between the Red Hats and the 57th Fighter Weapons Wing on a case-by-case basis. As Det 1 commander, Frick was the TAC point of contact responsible for these negotiations. While still a subordinate of the TIFWIC, writing the Red Baron reports and helping Suter establish flag, Frick was responsible for putting together test requirements, formal requests to get playtime with the MiGs, so that TAC could use them to evaluate tactics. The setups alternated between the MiG and the Air Force jet starting at one and a half miles behind each other, but the sorties were infrequent, and there were months on end where shortages of spares and maintenance issues caused the assets to stay grounded. Despite this, the small band of aggressive pilots developed the complexity of their exposures very quickly, and engagements of 2v2 or more were being flown by 1975. The men appeared to all intents and purposes as normal aggressor pilots and continued to spend most of their time flying the T-38s and F-5Es. By 1975, entire fighter squadrons were visiting Groom Lake to be read in on the MiG programme. In fact, Scott, who was at the time flying F-4Es at Seymour Johnson, had his first exposure to the MiGs on one such occasion. We got called in one Friday night and said, uh, we're leaving tomorrow morning on a C-130 can't tell you what we're going to do, but we're going out to, uh, we're going west, and we're going to spend the night at Nellis Air Force Base. Well, we flew west. We went to a base out west. They showed us a MiG-21, and they showed us a MiG-17. So that was the, the first thing. That was the whole squadron. And then we got all got on a bus and drove for a while and ended up at Nellis Air Force Base and went gambling all night long. Uh, downtown and got in C-130 the next day and came home. It was about a 48-hour trip out west where nobody slept except on the airplane. As the volume of idea sorties grew amongst the aggressors, Frick started analysing them in the same way that he had with the Red Baron reports. So then what he did is he created uh, another study to study all the engagements from the aggressors and the MiGs prior to constant pay has really uh, a lot of work because when we, whenever we flew the MiGs with the aggressor pilots uh, against F-4s or whatever, we had to come back and recreate, along with the F-4 pilots, recreate the engagement, the lessons learned out of each engagement, each, each mission. So each mission that was flown meticulously detailed about what worked, what didn't work, why the MiG shot the F-4 down or why the F-4 shot the MiG down. So, and he was in charge of that. We didn't fly him every day. We'd go up and fly a mission and uh, or two missions in a day. And then it'd take us almost the rest of the week to reconstruct it, get the lessons learned out of it. O'Neill had laid the seeds of a program that would eventually develop into something much, much bigger. All that was required now was a source of MiGs. The Indonesian Connection 
Eight and a half thousand miles away from Groom Lake, the CIA was continuing covert operations on the Asian archipelago of Indonesia. In 1970, the Indonesian Air Force had retired 30 MiG-17s, 10 MiG-19s, and 20 MiG-21s following the CIA-sponsored overthrow of the country's communist dictatorship. In response, Russia had quickly withdrawn engineering and maintenance support for the MiGs. Naturally, the aircraft broke and could not be fixed, and the Indonesians left them outdoors in the monsoon rain or pushed them unceremoniously into ditches and wetland. All was not lost, though. Under the military assistance program started by the Kennedy administration in the 1950s, the US Department of Defense supplied Indonesia with foreign military aid in the form of a multi-stage program to rebuild the country's once proud air force. Surplus US Air Force T-33 Shooting Star jet trainers and a number of UH-34D helicopters started arriving in the country in 1973, followed by the first batch of F-5Es and turboprop OV-10 Broncos in 1976. For Indonesia, all this material came at the modest price that included relinquishing ownership of its old MiGs, little more than a gesture considering they were unflyable and represented little value even as scrap. In fact, America had already transported four of Indonesia's MiG-21s to Groom Lake in 1973, and these were the source of the second half idea fishbed. The Indonesian government would not have known that it held the key to allowing the USAF to develop its DACT beyond what had always been the aggressor's limiting factor. The F-5 was a great MiG simulator, but it was still just an F-5 nonetheless. Some at Nellis had dared to dream the impossible. The impossible was about to become a reality. Music